The topic of today's lecture is risk management, managing risks. And uh, just to clarify, actually, when we talk about project management, we talk mainly about risk management. So the core, the core activity of project management is this thing, managing risks. Because if you are unable to define your risks, unable to, to mitigate them, uh, unable to do something about them, then your plan will be rigid, your plan will be unflexible, your plan will be uncertain, and you might not end up where you want it to be. Or you might do that, but with, with a lot of costs, extra costs that you could have saved. So this is the core of our effort in project management. So the learning objectives of this lecture, we will try to give you an overview to understand the concept of this. And uh, we would like also you to understand the difference between the risks that are associated with the project management effort, that is the efficiency of doing your work, and the, the risks that are associated with your final product. When we, when, when we are developing something, we are working. While we are working, there are something that could happen, right, that could damage our effort. Or when this thing is in operation, things also can happen. Happen, and damage your ability to achieve your impact or your outcome. So managing risks actually is about both of them. And we will look into primary causes or the sources of risks and uh, what are the key steps or the four major steps that we follow in order to define risks and mitigate these risks. Uh, and they look into the risk identification as a process because it's a very critical process. If you fail to identify risks, then the risk will be uh, wrong, actually. And then we will look into how we mitigate risks, how we resolve them, how we address them. There are several strategies that can be used, uh, and the project management should select the one that is correct for, for the project. And we will look into this process in its uh, entirety. Now, Pinto defines project management uh, or risk management as he says here, here, the art and the science of identifying, analyzing, and responding to risk factors throughout the lives of a project and in the best interest of its objectives. So as you can see here, it's a, it's a process, as you might uh, see. It's a process, and the goal of this process is to try to protect your objectives, your project objectives. These project objectives, we call them before project success criteria, if you may recall, right? And this is your goal all the time. You look what can harm you these objectives. And uh, having uh, this tool could be very valuable. And why it's valuable? I will show you a short video that explains the significance of having a project risk management process. on that. 
I hope you could see the point from that video. As you can see, a, a project test management actually uh, as a process is just a tool. Do we use it in order to make the project more predictable? We sit here today and we start thinking about events or factors or things that could happen that could harm our project or even harm our organization. So the, the, this is the main objective, to reduce the uncertainty in your plan in order to make your project more predictable. And uh, this is, as you can see, it's a form of proactive management. Rather than sitting and waiting in your office, waiting for things to happen, no, you are a little bit ahead. Right? You know there are two main approaches to management. One we call it reactive management, that you don't do anything and just solve problems uh, underway. The other approach is to be ahead all the time and figuring out what could go wrong. As you can also notice, you have noticed also from that video, that this risk management process has a lot of limitations. One important limitation, you cannot predict everything, right? You have no possibility to do that. Because, you know, it's about the future. The future is uncertain by its nature, right? We have no idea what could happen, and even worse, what, what would be the impact of what would happen. So remember that in mind you cannot use all of your time right, in planning just on risk management. We use it, uh, a main advantage of risk management is actually the learning. Because during this process, collecting information, disseminating information, discussing with other stakeholders, we learn more about the project. This is one of the most important Fact, uh, important reasons why we actually conduct risk management, learning. It's a good tool for learning about your project. This figure, I, uh, I took it from Pentu, and as you can see, Pentu, according to Pentu, he says that at the beginning of the project, the opportunity and risk is very high. And yes, why do you think it's very high at the beginning of the project? because we lack a lot of information. We are still at the bottom of our learning curve. And then, as we go, right, as we go, we collect more and more uh, information, we get more and more better, or we get better understanding of our project, therefore the opportunity is, and this is going down. But, at the same time, the amount at stake, which means that the impact, if anything happened, right, if you are not able to resolve your risks upfront, increases as we move uh, along the timeline. And the, the dashed line, it shows the risk impact. It's the, actually simply the, uh, uh, the result when you, when you conduct, uh, when, you, when you multiply the probability of an event multiplied by the consequences of that event. And as you see, the period of the highest impact is during the execution phase and prior to, to completion phase. Because there, the risks cost you a lot if you don't resolve them upfront. The, the issue of risk management or the subject of risk management actually is not new. Any, any, any respected organization, any respected entrepreneur, would have, is, they, they are doing that all the time. We have the Egyptians did that in the pyramids. The Babylons did that in the, in the hanging garden of Adams. And uh, Roald Amundsen, the Norwegian explorer, in 1911. And once I was watching a TV program, and he was talking about the expedition to the South Pole. You know, you should really read, that, uh, read more about that expedition. Because he was competing with another British officer, Scott. And that British officer is a marine officer, right? With, you know, command and control and, you know, the way of thinking, the military way of thinking. And they were competing. Who will come to the South Pole first? And, of course, it was 
global embassy. And what, why everybody asking why he managed that, but that British officer with a lot of resources, that marine officer, he had more resources than, 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 than Amazon. They say one reason for that is because Amazon tried to understand, tried to learn everything about his expedition before actually he did that. One of the things he did, he wanted to understand how it is to live on ice for a very long period of time. So this gentleman, he went and lived with the Eskimos, lived with them for a period of six months, so that he learns everything about ice, because this is the context of his expedition. And when he gathered all that experience, learning, you see, he learned up front. And then, for him, the project after that was just executing what, we, what, we, what he had learned before. And this is something Scott didn't understand. So uh, in that TV program, Amundsen was describing his approach to, to, the, to, the, to, the, to the expedition. And he says here, it is not just the money that ensures victory in such a long expedition. They are good to have. What really matters is how the expedition is equipped with the right resources, of course. In any project, you need the right resources, number one. And then, he explains further. And how all the challenges are identified in advance and the means to mitigate or eliminate these challenges are implemented. Actually, these two sentences, he says, he describe the very first two processes in project risk management as we know today. Number one, you have to identify your challenges, difficult things that might lie ahead in front of you. And then, understand these challenges, you will try to do something about them. And this is actually is project risk management explained in, in very, very short sentences by Amazon. And then, victory awaits those who has everything in order, right? Luck, they call it. Defeat is definitely due for those who do not take the necessary actions in time. And this is another, uh, uh, the other two processes we know in project risk management. You, uh, you need to take actions. That's what we call mitigation plan. And then, in time. This is what, what we call control plan. So every, every risk management process contains the identification, right? The assessment, how bad they are, to mitigate some of them, and then to control the execution of the mitigation process. So you see, and this is luck, according to, to Amundsen. So for him, luck is actually performing uh, a robust project risk management, not because of a coincidence. There is nothing, according to this uh, chart here, uh, says that luck exists. Luck doesn't exist. Luck exists if we want luck to be existing by doing things up front. So this is a summary of these four stages of project risk management. I call them sometimes the Roland Amundsen steps. Helps me to, to understand uh, or to recall the process exactly as he described. Number one, you identify your risks. What could go wrong? And remember, remember, you should also think about the operation phase. What could go wrong in the operation phase? What could go wrong in the execution phase? And then you have to do an assessment. Some of these risk factors are not really big, and some of them are really big. Uh, how can we differentiate between a risk that is big and a risk that is small? Uh -huh. Here comes this probability into, uh, into play. Each risk factor has a probability and a consequence. And the risk exposure is the, uh, the product of these two. That's why, that's why 
walking on the sidewalk is less risky than biking. Why do you think is that? Why walking is less risky than biking? Why we say it is less risky? Because the probability that accident happens to you when you bike is higher. This is number one. Higher than if you are walking on the sidewalk. And number two, if accident happen, when if you fall from your bike because of gravity, because of height, you could harm yourself much more than if you fall when you are walking. So the multiplicity of these two brings you the risk exposure. That's why we call it more risky because of these two factors. So you need to know which of your risks are really risky or more risky than others. And these are the ones that you need to focus on, to address. And then you develop, you develop a plan. What shall we do for each risk factor that we have in our project, or even in the operation field? This is the mitigation. There are standard strategies to do this job. And then you do risk monitoring. Of course, you make your plan, but then you have to make sure that you really enforce or apply your measures of risks to mitigate these risks at the right time. This is what we, that's what's the key. You can't <laughs> mitigate risks after it's too late. So you really have to include in your plan when these risks should be mitigated and by who. It's another part of your plan. Now, the very first phase in, 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 in this process is the risk identification. Here, we sit together, all the project team members. Sometimes we can have uh, help from previous project, project managers from previous projects. They come to us and perhaps help us, guide us what have gone wrong in their projects, what they have learned from their project. This is one way to understand risks. And then sometimes we can go and ask some consultants, people who are working on this field, project management, what could go wrong? Uh, and then sometimes we uh, can do it inside the group, do some sort of brainstorming. Although current project management literature says that this brainstorming is really, really dangerous. You know why? Because people tend to get very, very wild, right? They start thinking of events that is very, 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 very unlikely. And it's fine, but the, the danger in that, that we use much of our time talking about these extreme situations, you know? You could have the black swans, they call it, right? Talking about them, and only about them. And remember, they are the probability of these events are so small that they are most likely will not happen. And we tend to forget what is under, uh, where, 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 where you have this 50-50 probability. We tend to, to overlook them because we focus on the extreme cases on both sides of our care. So people say, don't really use this brainstorming or use it in cautious because people get very wild. And they, we advise to use several uh, techniques, not only one. Experience is very important. Learning is very important. People from competence, you can develop your own competence. Do like uh, uh, Roald Amundsen, before you start a project, maybe you can make simulation even for your project before you can start it so that you learn about the outcome. And the, here are some key issues when you identify your risk factors. You, number one, it's very important to involve the people who will be doing the work packages. Again, because they are capable by their experience to identify risk, and not only to identify risk, to avoid risk through their working processes. <coughs> And also, if you involve them at early stage, you create better uh, ownership to these risk avoidance uh, measures, 
And that's very important that when we agree that we are going to uh, avoid the risk in such a way that everybody really adheres to that. And of course, if you are working on an IT project, you need people who have done IT. If you are working on a building project, you need people who have been building projects. So experience. And number three, and this is also very important, and it always reminds me of Amazon, you have to understand your project context. Where your project will be run. Huh? What kind of environment? What kind of constraints? What are your project objectives? Sometimes people fall in this trap. For instance, we know that the most important factor in our project is to deliver within time. That's very important. And then when they go and discuss like what could go wrong, they go and discuss things maybe related, let's say, to cost. Uh, and maybe they relate as things they related to uh, the working environment inside the project group. That's nice. But first, you have to address, you address the real challenges huh, that could harm your objectives. And understand. It's really about understanding your project context. Now, what kind of problems? Now, you see, we have to do it this way. We have to evolve. We have to think uh, holistically. And we need to have that experience. What kind of problems? Why many projects fail because we don't do it right? Why do you think that? What's wrong? Why can't we just do it this way? Do you have any reflections on that? What kind of problems? Why we don't, why we don't do it right? Why we don't address risks up front? Why we just make a plan and assume that everything will go fine? Why do you think that? Any reflections? Time constraints. Yes, one of the things that really uh, is a problematic is because people will tend to tell you that, but we don't have time, right? We are under pressure to deliver, and we don't have time. And there is one thing you could, you could say to these people. We will make time. That's because, because uh, you see, the consequences of not addressing these things, as you saw from print to graph, the amount at stake is, becomes higher as we proceed in the project. Then you have to make time. That's where you have to create this sense of uh, responsibility within that. Very good. Because people will tell you we don't have time. Other reasons. What is it? Yeah, or, or I let me say, uh, like, turn it around. People sometimes, because of this over of confidence, they uh, become ignorant, right? They become ignorant to the fact that this process should be structured, and then they expect, usually, uh, like uh, uh, higher or quicker solutions. Uh, or uh, they don't see the point because of this overconfidence, right? They think that, okay, I can do it, I have done it before, I don't need to put it down in papers, to lay it down in papers. So, yes, uh, this was another problem. Very good. Other things, what do you think? Just come, uh, there's no other solution for that. Any other issue could you think of? I will show you something here that also impact the way we are doing business in project. It's called the conformity. Look at this. How people... Well, the experiment is not a public opinion poll. It examines behavior under the pressure of social forces as the... So, as you can see, there are a lot of problems associated with, the, with this... Uh, identification process, and not only with the identification, it can, it can also uh, reach the, the mitigation, your mitigation plans, and it can influence your, your, your risk monitoring uh, activities. Uh, number one, they don't have time. They don't. Then you have to do something about it. Actually, you have to make it an, a part of your project plan, is how to address the risk. Number two, people expect quicker solutions. The people who are involved in your project, they want it quicker, they want it faster. 
And sometimes, because of this overconfidence, right, they can see the point. They know each one of them, they know a lot, and they know how to handle risks. But our objective here is to collect all these experiences and share it among all other group members. Again, because risk management process is a tool for learning. And the group dynamic factors. We will always have to be aware of them. Somebody will try to be dominant. Somebody will be indifferent, doesn't care. Somebody has bias. Somebody uh, is confirming. And a good project manager also play a role of a facilitator or a moderator in order to reveal these problems and address them uh, accordingly. Uh, now we take a break and in the next lecture we will look into the categories of risks as we know. <coughs> we don't take it. So now what, what would be the, the, the if we ask now when we are in the process of uh, defining uh, risk factors, where to begin? This is usually a problem. Where to begin? How can we start this process of identification of different risk factors? So one way to do it is to look into categories or clusters of risk. These are groups of things huh, that uh, are or, 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 or a source of different types of risk factors. For instance, Pale 2, he suggests in page 239 to look at the financial risk. Financial risk in the sense that usually some developers, they initiate a, a building project actually without having a contracted buyer up front. This could be a risky because you might end up in a, in a huge complex without people to buy it. And that's why if you look here in Norway, the, 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 the practice here is to sell at least 80% of the uh, complex before they actually start building it. It's one of the conditions that you might see in the, in the contract if you, are, if you want to buy a new flat, a new house, a new something. They have to sell before they actually commence on development. You have something called the technical risks. Of course, if you are working with uh, a small like, uh, project that you have done before, then the technical risks are much, much, much less than working on a new product development with a lot of novelty, you know, because of the uncertainty, because of the ambiguity. So new product development is more risky than ordinary projects. And sometimes it's about the contract. What kind of contract do you have with your entrepreneur? Sometimes if you have a lump sum project, the risk is, all the risk is on the entrepreneur. They take the risk. But if you have a reimbursable type of project, then it is you who will take the risk. So this is something has to be defined according to the type of organization you use to regulate your relationship with the contract. Sometimes it's about the commercial risk. Again, it might be linked to this financial risk, but here uh, you are, let's say you are developing something for the, for, the, for the project. Can you focus with me, please? And sometimes you are developing something for the open market, right? And you are want to produce uh, a large scale uh, uh, product uh, or a product for a large mass. Then there is also this commercial factor. Uh, they will buy it, maybe they change their opinion, maybe they don't want it after a few years, especially after a few years. People change their opinion very often, and this is linked to, to the commercial risks. And then you have the execution risk. While you are doing your work, a lot of things could happen. For instance, the location, the, the, the complexity of the location itself, the difficulty of the location itself, design complexity, and then the force Majoras. First Majoras, sometimes we call them act of gods. 
You know why we call them acts of God? Because these are types of things you have no control whatsoever about. For instance, if an earthquake <coughs> erupts, or a volcano, or, or, or uh, you know, a few years ago in Iceland, a volcano erupted, and then the ashes from the volcano, not in Ireland, in Iceland, but almost in the entire northern hemisphere, they uh, disrupted the air traffic. And a lot of people had to cancel. And I myself, once I was supposed to travel to, to Oslo to give a lecture there, and then 30 people were waiting, and this, everything was booked. So the only means for traveling is to hire a cab. And I had to pay 16,000 kroner to, to, to get there. Right? Because this is the only available means. Imagine now if you are in a project, project in school, and these things happen all the time. Huh? Then understanding these risks can also be useful. One important thing I really want you to, to remember, when you are doing project, project risk management, do not only think about the project itself, only the project itself. You need to think about the entire life cycle, both the efficiency criteria and the effectiveness criteria. I also prefer to, when I develop a risk uh, Structure, I prefer to do something we call risk breakdown structure. I like to think of the sources of risks as the people. They are always source of risk. The people who are involved either in the operation phase or in the project phase, they are always a problem, will create a problem for you and for the product. And the structure, that is, how are we organized? How, we, how, how is our project group organized? Uh, is this organization fit for purpose? Or do we have problems? And you also need to think about the organization of the operational phase. Is it fit for purpose? Or is there any problem that could arise in that phase that could harm your objectives? And then, all the time, we need to look at your context. Where this project is taking place? Obviously, we no need to dwell on that. If you are conducting a project, let's say, in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in Norway, OK? Norway has its own rules and regulations that you have to adhere to all the time, right? And you have to operate from within these rules. But if you took the same project, the same project, and try to implement it, let's say, in Venezuela or in Mexico, then you will have two different contexts. Your approach should be different between the, because the type of risks are also different. Context is very important. And uh, the technology. This is what kind of product you are producing, what kind of equipment you are using to produce your product. What kind of infrastructure do you have so that your product can be used in the operation phase? These are issues that we need to address to understand upfront. And just to make sure that you are with me, these uh, categories or clusters that you want, they are very much linked to each other. They are not very, uh, like, they are not independent. Just for example, you the risks associated with your products, let's say the side effects, any product when you produce it, it's always had side effects, right? And where these side effects manifest themselves, they manifest themselves in the environment, right? So it hits back to your environment, and because of that, maybe this environment also will react to your product, and it might harm again your product. And it's because of this closed loop relationship between, let's say, the product and the context. Yeah. Will the people be only that um, which is involved in the project? No, also in the operation phase. When I say people, you have people in the project and in the operation phase. I will come back to that. Oh, you asked about that. So in the project phase, let's look at the people. And by the people, by the way, I mean people. 
I'm not meaning organization, just individuals who are working with you. What are the problems that you could, you should really think about? A major problem that they change their prioritization. That's often a problem with organizations that has many projects that run in parallel. So suddenly, the top management or the top leader, right, at the beginning of your project, he's with you. He wants to support you. He gives you resources. You are, you, you, you are his guy, right, or girl, right? But after a while, after a while, they change the prioritization. This is a risk because it will harm your ability to negotiate for resources. And another risk that you also think opposition from individuals, environmental groups, that they don't like what you do, or they don't like what is your product is supposed to do. That's a risk. And sometimes in your project group, the motivation goes down, especially happens when, when your project is, takes a longer period of time. Uh, another factor you should think the availability of resources, again, uh, we don't really have access to all resources. Sometimes, you know, people get sick, right? Sometimes people go or leave. Sometimes people get fired. So how can we, uh, like, respond to this kind of risks in our, in our project? Uh, in the operation phase, a lot of issues also repeat themselves, especially the availability of resources in the operation phase. Uh, access to qualified people in the operation phase is always a problem. That's why many projects, they start training and learning and mentoring activities during the project so that they have qualified people at the end of the project. Support or resistance in the operational phase. Sometimes people, when you have a new project, they challenge that. When you have a new product. You introduce, let's say, something to to uh, to make the the the, yeah, the running of a business better. People will always challenge that. People doesn't like changes, right? And then, how can you reduce this resistance? How can you address the, these resistance? These are typical types of risks you will see because of the people. Motivation, commitment, availability, support, resistance, right? And uh, this kind of uh, involvement, right? We have to look to. Now, what we do usually? Counter measures. One of the measures that we uh, do is to provide training, right? If you feel that you don't have the right amount of resources, then you will do that training. So, all of a sudden, as you can see now, I look like with me on this uh, line of thought. You, you will have to start provide training. Then, providing training become a part of your project. Although actually it is not, it wasn't before. But you provide training in order to address a risk. And another factor is to involve key stakeholders in key decisions. Especially decisions that will impact their way of doing work during the operation phase. Don't come and tell them you have, you will get this new system in a few months and you will have to just use them. You will get even higher resistance. So involve them. Let them be with you so that you can reduce this resistance. Uh, sometimes I, I talk once to a project manager and I ask them, how do you really keep the motivation inside your project group? He said, he said, from time to time, I call these people and ask them for a meeting. And then during the meeting, we talk about the difficult thing in our project. And we talk about what kind of solutions each one of these people are trying to enforce or uh, apply. And this, he told me, gives the people like a kick. It reminds them of the challenge of their project and the possibility that they can come with a good solution. So you can keep motivation by reminding people how clever they are, how important the work they are doing. Uh, you can also have some standby people, standby resources, you know, just in case something goes wrong. And we always in the project, we have to establish 
some performance measure. And the objective of this performance measure is to hold the people responsible. People like actually to be held responsible. Uh, if you will, you will operate better if you know that somebody will come and ask you, what have you done? Why have you, have you done that? Show me your results. Totally different than you just go, you are a good guy, do the job. Yeah, trust is good, but control is also good. So you have to balance trust and control. This is the key word with people, trust and control. Change, when it comes to change, is it, uh, expect resistance, always. What to do? Try to get them a little bit involved in this process. Let them realize the importance of these changes that they will have. And then comes the second issue, the product, the technology related factor. Actually, here I could talk an entire lecture about it with, with the different issues that could arise. So I have tried to summarize uh, some of the most important factors that could happen. Uh, for instance, in the operation phase, what usually happens? Failure, you know? Sometimes the system fails to produce, or the system fails to, to work as you uh, want it to, uh, or as you have designed it to operate. This is uh, something that happens. Uh, another thing is the side effects. Any system you produce will have an impact on other things. And I have in mind one very important example from here, from Trondheim. In Trondheim, the, the municipality here developed a project that's called the Rockheim Museum. And like four years ago or three years ago, at night, the entire uh, roof of this Rockheim Museum was <coughs> a lot of beautiful lights, beautiful colors, you know, Really, it was a, like, like a, a painting. They draw a painting, different paintings using colors. But you know what happens? These light bulbs they were using, they were generating a frequency that interfered with the frequency the flight controllers used when they were communicating with the planes. And there was a huge interface, uh, and uh, regulation came from the state, stop, turn off the lights. And that building was supposed to be, you know, the thing about that building is these lights. They want to give a new uh, image to the night sky of Trondheim. And now it's like uh, an old dead building standing there, ugly. Actually, it's not nice looking at it. So they lost an important impact factor just because they did not think of the long-term side effect of the technology they are using. Uh, another problem is about the technology, and always this happens, I will warn you. In any organization you will be developing projects, somebody will come and tell you there is a new technology, right? We need to use that technology. It will really make our uh, days, uh, like, we will do things better with this technology. But then you can ask them, do we really have the infrastructure to use that particular technology? Or do we really to like rebuild the entire the infrastructure, huh? change the entire infrastructure so that we can use this kind of technology? And in some projects, they fail to think about that. And when you get your service, when you get your final result, it wouldn't communicate with your existing platforms. And then you have to this card, this immune system, that cost uh, you a lot of money. Uh, I also here uh, uh, recall another project here from Trondheim. It's about a voice recognition system that the, the hospitals want to introduce here in the hospital. You know, previously, doctors, they wrote something on the paper, right? And they gave it to the nurses or, you know, this other personnel. And the nurses, you know, wrote it in the journal. Or they wrote it directly in the journal. And, you know, writing directly in a patient journal could take time. And it's also paper-based. 
and they want to make sure that all these papers are like stored as in, a, in a safe place. So they thought they introduced this voice recognition system. And in this voice recognition system, the doctor would have something like this and describe the, the, the patient's problem. But the problem that this voice recognition system was made for the Americans. Mainly, it's an English language based and uh, the technology is designed for that. Now in Norway, there are hundreds of different dialects, right? People talk, when we talk, when they talk, they really don't talk so that things should be like standard book mode. They talk as they used to do in this thing. And then the text they get, they got in that uh, journal is totally wrong. Totally wrong. Has nothing to do with the patient case. Like uh, uh, one statement I recall that was written, the patient had ears before, but they have fallen off. <laughs> like, yeah, I'm sure he wanted to say the patient had problems with the ear or something like that. But the tra when, when the voice recognition system uh, defined it, the patient had ears before, but they have fallen off. And this is typical problems you should think of when you look at. Uh, during the project itself, the availability of tools and equipment, machines, again, is a very decisive factor. How we, project organization, understood the product requirements. This is another problem. People think they understood because of ignorance, because of overconfidence, but they don't. Usually we have our own understanding of what the people want. So, countermeasures here, you, for instance, if you think that your system is very important and the, the reliability of your system is, should be very high, maybe when we are developing the, the solution or the product, maybe we should develop two. A backup in parallel with our original solution so that the one takes over if the other is uh, have fear, if it's a critical system. And again, as you can see, this decision will take it up front in the project, and it will have an impact on the cost and on the scope. So that's why it's important to analyze. And use another technology if your infrastructure is not good. Uh, if you uh, want to have a good people who will develop your product, do decent pre-qualification process. Use pilots prototyping, simulations, in order to understand product requirement, in order to make sure that your understanding with product required is equivalent to the uh, owner or, or, or the client understanding. Uh, study the implication of having this system uh, interacting with other systems. And there are uh, many companies who, do, who just don't do that job the interface implications, or do some simulations. The system related, related factors is about around all that, around the people who are working in your project, around the activities that you will perform so that you produce your product, there are a lot of organizational factors. For instance, one important factor is the kind of the project organization you are using. I do you remember from our lecture on the project organization? We say if you are working on a project organization that is uh, on a weak matrix, you are not able to make decisions. You, all the decisions will have to be done by the line manager, and then this hinders you, stops you from taking the right decision at the right time. You are not able to mobilize people to respond to changes, then this is a problem. So organizational structure can impact your ability to perform. Uh, 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 availability of resources during the project itself. I mean your financial resources, that you really have money to, to perform very well, can be a, a factor. And not only during the project, during the operation phase, imagine that you build a system, build a solution that require uh, salaries, for instance. People need to be paid. But 
if you didn't thought about it, you didn't have enough uh, liquidity, uh, you didn't have a, a system of how you are going to keep this uh, service in operation during the operation phase. That will cause your system to fail indeed. So corruption could be a factor during your project. This is like, if you are working here in Norway, maybe this is not a very, very <coughs> obvious problem, although it exists in Norway, this corruption. And, and by the way, corruption in Norway is bad if it's discovered. But it is there. In other countries, it is not bad at all. That's expected that you will have to, you know, uh, give some money, and maybe this corruption, uh, uh, because of we are operating with Norwegian rules, is, is, is not lawful. This, you can be punished by you, and some uh, major Norwegian companies, heads of Norwegian companies, were actually punished, and they are in prison right now, because of these corruption rules. So this is a risk factor. In other, some other countries, you wouldn't be able to do anything if you don't pay them off. Nothing. I can assure you. Some countries, African countries, uh, uh, Middle Eastern countries, nothing. You can't even lift a finger without giving something under the table. So, how to, uh, how to handle that? When your regulation here in Norway says no to that, what will happen if you are discovered? So, the, the, the the solution to this problem, usually organization structure, is how to, how clever you are to disseminate information, to distribute information, to tell the people about these problems, to tell, to try to get the people to share a common understanding of how to handle with these problems. It's a very soft issue. They are soft issues, and they are, should be dealt in a soft way. It's about information. It's about communication. Is about making sure that people know what they do. And in some situation, you need to change the structure, how things will be operated. And finally, there is always the subdivisions, the conflicts. And usually here, these are things that you have like little control over. They are very difficult to anticipate. Like the accidents, the weather, the natural catastrophes, political factors, and terrorism. Uh, like, who would have thought that uh, the facilities in Ain uh, al-Manas in Algeria would have been uh, attacked by terrorists? And uh, like, uh, 50 people were killed in these uh, atrocities. Right? Who had thought that would happen at that time? in a very remote place, in the middle of the Sahara, Great Sahara, it's secured, everybody thought it was secure, but these things happen. And these things would damage a lot of things. Uh, uh, I know that Stat Oil had worked very, very, very hard to, during this crisis, just to manage the crisis. But what can we do usually? We ask this question to avoid these things. Some countries, they change the regulation as often as you wash your hair. They don't have really uh, like a, a, a coherent set of regulations that you know up front. They change the regulation from day to day. And sometimes people who are working with you change this regulation just because they want that. This is again because of different working culture in different <coughs> places in the world. Uh, and sometimes you have problems because of a third party that's outside of the control. So these things, how is about your control, things that are about outside your control. What can we do? One of the things we usually do is this insurance. That's why we pay insurance. Exactly to, to handle the force majeure. And provide training. Like, like we are afraid of a terror attack. What we can provide? Safety training evacuation training, right, to our employees so that they don't get hard. Uh, you have always to have a contingency plan in case of changing regulation, changing routines, changing environment. And in some projects, they actually develop technical solutions
to reduce the impact of, all, uh, of external factors. Uh, last year in the uh, North Sea, uh, you know, in the North Sea, there are really, really, really high waves. It's a violent environment. And they were building a, a platform in, 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 this, uh, in these waters. And they calculated that the force of waves will be so strong that this structure will not really tolerate uh, these waves. And they couldn't change the design, because if they change the design, then this will impact the functionality of this uh, facility. So what they did, so actually they built another facility around this facility so that it reduced the impact of these high waters uh, uh, on, the, on the original uh, facility. This is another means to reduce the impact of environmental factors by building something more. So I hope you again can see it. Every, every countermeasure you take, it will cost you time, it will cost you resources, it will cost you money, uh, it, you need to make investments, right? And this investment, time, resources, and money has to be reflected inside your project plan. And if you recall from our discussion about wet breakdown instruction, the second slide, there, it was two keywords. Wet breakdown instruction consists of deliverables plus risk mitigation strategies. You have a deliverable, you have a facility that will stand in the, in the North Sea, but it cannot stand the element, and you have to protect it with another facility. That other facility become a part of your way to bring down the How, this is how we do it. Now, let me explain all that with a, a case that you are familiar with. You remember this case. This is the Avi Noor, the Norwegian uh, Aviation Authority project, was conducted in 2004, and the, the objectives of this uh, project was to produce better reports. In the old days, because when the snow comes very heavily, they were not able to produce these reports in accurate time. And then they have to close down the airport. So they wanted to do something about it. And then uh, producing these reports actually is a time consuming. I will show you how a report looks like. This is a report. And this is usually when done manually. A person was going around the runway and take measurements and write this thing. And it was sometimes full of errors. Can't really do it right <laughs> all the time. It was full of errors, one thing. And the other thing that when it was snowing heavily, they couldn't really go and do it as often as possible because of lack of resources. So the project decided to do something and do this process entirely uh, or uh, uh, automated. So they, the system they have used was very, very simple. It's extremely simple system. It is a, 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 a sensor was mounted on a four-wheel drive, and this sensor was connected to the GPS network so that they know where, which location on the airport. And the measurements were taken, and the driver sat down and pushed the button and drive. And the sensor measured the different points along the runway and generated that report by itself. And then through the wireless network, right, they sent this report to this a simple, cheap desktop. And this desktop took this report and disseminated further to other <coughs> the people who will clean the runway, the people, the pilots who were supposed to that. So as you can see, the, sim the, 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 the technical solution here was a very, very simple solution. But what these people did, and, uh, so that they can uh, address all these risks, all these possible risks we have, for, in for, for instance, they talk about people. One, one challenge here that the end users do not adopt the new system. You come now with totally electronic system. 
to that. People are not used to, do, to use that. So you might expect resistance. That's the one thing. Uh, or because it was difficult. So maybe the, these people think that, that well, a new solution is difficult. So they were resistant. That was the risk. And what was their action? They say, OK, involve the end users, which means that they conducted a project group where end users were represented in this group. And they went and looked for demonstrators, different solutions, and asked the people which of one of these solutions we have is the most uh, easy to use, the one which you would prefer, the one which you would like and at the same time do the job that you are doing. So they were involved in this process of selection and evaluating possible solutions. <coughs> and another measure they did that, rather than starting the, the project in all the airports at Norway, they started in one, uh, at one airport, in Tromsø airport. And there they uh, implemented the system, a pilot. And they learned a lot from that pilot, like Amundsen when he went and lived six months with the Eskimo. That was his pilot. Learned a lot about the, how the system works, what's, what are the problems. And from that, uh, they developed a training program. So there are many measures we can do to address the users. Number two, ah, these people, of course, Avinor doesn't really develop systems, they buy systems. But they thought, what happens if these providers or these entrepreneurs went back rapidly? What will happen to our system? Of course, we will have to find another uh, provider, and this might cause even more problems for us. So they did a, a decent pre qualification process. They use established providers, not just the startups. And they have selected a long term partner, 15 years. And another is safety issue. When your product is in operation, because now, you know, we are not doing things by hand, somebody is doing them electric yeah, in, 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 in <coughs> automatic ways. So there are always risks when you change the way of how people work. So they wanted to know what are the implications, the risk implications of this work. Yes, they took everything, right, and went to a company that studied that risk. And they studied these implications and came with measures. And these measures, they have used these measures in order to differentiate between possible solutions. Which solution? Uh, address these measures. And uh, last, uh, right, that the operation process could be seen by some of the people as complex. What is the solution to that? Provide training. So this is the things they thought about during the project phase. And they also then thought about these things also during the uh, Sorry, they thought about in the operation phase and they thought about them also in the project phase. Like one risk is conflict with other projects. Uh, Avi Moore, they run like 50 projects each year, right? And uh, they need people, they need commitments, they need motivation, they need different things. So they were afraid of conflicts between other projects. So project management group, they were very clever in going out to all other projects with all these line management people, asking for commitment, asking for support, telling them about the importance for this project, for the safety. It's about safety of the people, safety of the travelers. They also thought about the problems with the three providers they have. Because in this project, in order to reduce the uh, how, uh, vulnerability, uh, they went to three different providers rather than using one. But having three different providers means that you need really better coordination and communication between 
these sensory providers, who will start first and how they will coordinate them. The project said we will do the entire uh, work. We will do that. So all the sub-coordination uh, and communication between the provider was done by the project. And this is a, a risk mitigation technique. And if you recall, this is one, well, this is what you're assigned, right? This is what was your in-class assignment last week. Everything you, you had described, everything described in that paper I gave to you was about combination of deliverables and combination of risk factors. And you can even see you have a phase one, you have pilot, you have a <coughs> project, and you have project management. <coughs> Here you have the different deliverables as well as the different risk mitigation measures that this organization have implemented so that we get the project done. And they did that. Then just to remind you of uh, the, the four stages of project risk management. The very first stage is the risk identification, finding out the risk, different types of risk in both project phase and in the operation phase. And then the next step is the risk assessment and prioritization of these risks. In order to do this process uh, in a proper way, we need a tool. And this tool is called risk matrix. It's again a graphical something like that. As you can see, it is just a, a table. And in one dimension, this dimension for instance, you can identify or you can try to look into the impact of a risk factor. Impact could be impact on time, impact on scope, impact on productivity, impact on earning, or any other success criteria that is important for your uh, process. And we usually we make one matrix for each for each success criteria. So we cannot combine matrices uh, or two, two different success criteria in one matrix. It could be confusing. So for each, each, risk each uh, success criteria, you will have one risk matrix. So here, for instance, what you do? You start saying, okay, what will be the impact of this risk factor, any particular risk factor on us? And then we can divide it. First, we start with this qualitative approach to risk management. First, we say, well, it has a small impact on uh, on our time, for instance. And, or it could have a medium impact. Or it could have a large impact. This is one way to look about the classification of impacts on, uh, on each uh, uh, project object. And then, somebody asks, but is, what is the probability that could happen? You have one risk factor. For instance, one person, one important key person in your project group do not show up, right? What is the probability of that? You can say, well, it's a low probability. This person is fit, is young, is, has uh, done it before, he is committed, he is motivated, right? So the probability is low. Or you could say it's medium. Well, this person maybe has a history of uh, coming late or just dropping out in the middle of a project. Or you can say it's very, very high like combination of many things. So for each risk factor, you try to study where we will put it in this risk matrix. This is what this is the risk assessment is all about. To study or to try to figure out the impact or the probability of each risk factor. And then, by the way, now you can figure it out yourself. Now you have, if you are working on three by three 
risk factors or uh, risk matrix there. These are the ones that in the that red corner, what kind of characteristics they have? Yes, they either have high or medium probability, right? Or they have medium and large impact. So this group of risk factors, the red group of risk factors, is what we refer to critical risk factors. They are serious risk factors because they are too risky not to address. And then the other group is diagonal line. As you can see here, a diagonal line could have high probability but small impact, or medium probability but medium consequence, or very high impact but low probability. This line, this diagonal line, is what we refer to moderate type of risk or significant risks. And then we have this green zone. Green zone is when everything is small and low or medium and low or medium and small. We call them marginal risk factors, minor risk factors. This is one way how we classify this. We look into impact and we look into probability and we put these two into this risk matrix. And of course, you have, maybe you have already figured out that the one that are red, that we something we must do something about. We cannot live with them in the project. And the one which is R in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in yellow, again, we need to do something about it. But maybe not. We could have that option because they are moderate or significant risk. But we can try maybe to reduce the impact or the probability of this risk. And then we have the marginal or minor risk. Now, this, this description here I am putting uh, in front of you, it is was what is referred to qualitative risk management. Here, actually, we do not e describe exactly what is the impact. We don't convert large into money yet. Uh, or we don't convert probability into exact numbers. When we, when we do that, we go over to the quantitative risk management. And the quantitative risk management is a special discipline. It's a lot of mathematics, a lot of simulations, a lot of probability distributions, uh, a lot about uh, previous information. And I feel that this is like not the subject of this course. Here we have a course called risk management or managing risk. And that course is only about the qualitative, as the quantitative assessment of risk using number, using statistical distribution. So you will be able to calculate the risk exposure of any event that could happen in the film. But here, in order to keep the discussion uh, on a higher level, we will stick only to the, the, the qualitative assessment of, of risk. So the risk impact could be a significant, could be a critical, could be marginal. That's enough in order to go far. And then we ask, what we do? What we do if your, your risk is critical, or if the risk impact is critical? What shall you do? What shall you do if your risk impact is marginal? Here comes the third uh, process, the risk mitigation, or if you want, risk response planning. You need to do something. Right? And what you need to do can fall in one of these categories. Anything you do, you can just put it in one of these four categories. For instance, you can say, aha, uh -huh, I will not do anything. Right? I will just live with it. It's perhaps too risky to implement a mitigation strategy. Perhaps it's too costly to do something about it. Perhaps I don't have time to do something about it. Then I will accept it. This is one strategy. You accept your risk. Another strategy is to try to minimize your risk. And can you now figure out what can we minimize, actually? When we 
if we are going to minimize, this is the risk in that. What can we minimize here? There are two things you can minimize, actually. Yes, any, any, any suggestion? Consequence. Yes, you can minimize, try to shift from the yellow line, right, to the green line, or from the red one to <laughs> to all probability, exactly. And this is actually what we do when we say we want to minimize this. We try to reduce the consequences if it happens. The best example, like I told you in the previous lecture, what happens if your system failed, you are working, you are digging something, and this excavator stopped working. What, how can you reduce the consequences of delay? by having a standby. You can just put it in there, then the standby excavator will do the job. You didn't lose any time because you are have reduced the consequences. And how can you reduce the probability that your excavator will go busted? By maintenance up front. Or absolutely, before you start, you go and buy a new one so that you can make sure that it will have less probability to, 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 to go faster. So this is what we do when we minimize this. It's either consequences or probability. Or you might want to share your risks. I know I am not able to do that myself. So I should go to another company, give them some extra money so that they can take this job from me. I share risks with them. And I tell them if anything happens, we can share the, the problem. This is a way to reduce your, the impact. And or transfer the risk. You tell them, I don't want anything to do with this part of this project. You will have to do everything for me. And for that, I am willing to pay you, uh, or I am willing to use a reimbursable contract type, which means just wait and I pay, because it's too risky for me. And then they take the responsibility. If anything happens, they have to be the responsible one. The fourth or the fifth category is contingency reserve. Contingency reserve is something we use actually when we accept risks. We say, OK, we accept it, but let's have some flexibility. Let's have some reserve. The project can use it. And we distinguish between task contingency and managerial contingency. Task contingency for a smaller type of risks. But managerial contingency is for, for instance, the force majoris. There we need a bigger pot to, to handle these big things that we absolutely had no idea about them at the beginning of the project. So any, anything you do with risks, anything, will, as you can see, it will impact your will break down the structure because you will need new tools, new measures, new things to implement them. And it will impact your budget because you need contingency there. And it will impact your plan because you need more time. Uh, you need more buffers in your time plan. So this is the thing about this. It improves your basis plan or your baseline for your project. And then the last thing we do, everything I have explained to you, you put it in a document. And this document is called the risk register. This is a very valuable tool for you as a project manager in parallel with the risk matrix. Huh? Here it's uh, just an uh, ordinary Excel uh, sheet. Here you put the description of your risk factor, responsible person for each risk, probability, low, high, medium, and so on, consequences on different types of uh, stakeholder uh, success criteria, and when and what possible measures can be taken. And then you follow on that up by recording the state. What happened? Have we implemented that mitigation? Did the risk occur 
And what was the real impact of that risk compared with the, our original estimation of the impact learning? And this risk register looks something like that. It's a very good tool to control your projects. Now, I would like to show you an example of the entire process. And I have with me some uh, uh, a web package that I, uh, I can share with you. And uh, my web package here is to cycle to work. I like to buy. But I am very concerned about time, as you may have observed. So I really want to come on time. I don't want to be late. So I want you to help me now to construct a risk matrix for, any, for these factors that can hinder me from coming on time. And of course, I want to come on time, but also in safe. I don't want to have injuries. So these are my objectives, these are my success criteria. I want to come here at 10, not later than 10 o'clock so that I can uh, make my gears, make things ready. And I want to be safe. And I want you to help me achieving this objective by defining risk factors and defining measures that can help me to uh, achieve it. And I suggest all of you especially who comes late, try to do this exercise that will be helpful as well for you. Threats. Now, I bike, and one of the threats usually, uh, it is uh, malfunction. That, you know, punctured, my tire get punctured, right? Uh, uh, the brakes stops breaking. Uh, the pedals stop or the <coughs> chain fall from the pedals and so on. These are typical mal malfunctions that happens when you buy. Or risk number two, accident. You know, we are in the fall now, it's raining, there is wind, you know. Uh, maybe when I bike in the morning, maybe there is a thin, thin layer of ice that makes the road slippery, then I could fall. Or not only that, maybe I crash with pedestrians, people who are walking. Maybe uh, cars hit me, maybe a bus <coughs> hits me, maybe the, the trick hits me, you know? Maybe I get hit by a comet from the sky. These, these things could happen to me because I am exposed to the elements, right? And then risk number three, I follow a certain road and sometimes, because you know they are building a lot where I live, then all part of the road, or maybe not all, but all, all part of the road is closed. These are like very generic risk factors. Now, why these risks are important? Now, if something, anything happened with my equipment, my equipment is a bike. Think of it as my, you know, <laughs> instrument that I will, yeah. Whether it's not a threat? In itself, or is that it's a, it's a, it will impact like if the weather is bad, then it will be more likely than okay. So it's not no, I didn't I didn't want to say I am I like I was hit by a lightning. <laughs> lightning. lightning. Yeah, could it could it? <coughs> Let's say I just focus on injuries regardless of what, and also on delays regardless of what. To keep it simple. And then if I if my bike stops for any reason, then I will come late to you, right? Delay. And if accident, I will get injured. And it will also delay. Maybe because I will have to go to the hospital and get some treatment. And I will come like with a lot of bruises and maybe you lose your concentration. Right? And all part of the road is closed. That caused delay. It will not uh, damage me physically, but it will delay. Okay. Now, this is the information about the threats. I also try to give you an idea about what kind of equipment I am using, because understanding context is 
very important, as this young lady said about. What about the weather then? So the equipment, it is off-road bike. I bought it in 2012. It's good tire, reflectors, lights, brake, tip-top. Nothing wrong with it. Surroundings, front hand from Lada to Valgrinna, it's fall. Weather forecast, light rain showers. That day or the night before, they say it will rain a little bit. Actors, myself, I bike all year around. So I know how to bike. I, there's no problem with that. Estimated duration travel time from where I live until here through t Holt is like 25 minutes. So now you have all the information. Now what we construct here, we construct two matrices. One matrix for the time and one matrix for the engine. And for simplicity, I will keep it two by two matrices. Okay? Are you with me? Now. Now again, I put the everything in front of you. And estimated time travel is 25 minutes. I could live with a delay of five minutes. You know, I can take it again later. But more than five minutes, I will consider huge impact. Five minutes and less small impact. So this is my time consequences. And then I have the probability. I have the low probability and high probability. I didn't associate it with number because just go with your feelings what's low and what's high. And now, what is the probability that you have uh, a malfunction in, with providing this information? It's a new bike. It's tip-top. Everything is fine. So bike is good. I know how to bike. So what is the probability that it happens? Low and and what is the consequence? Now, if my tires are punctured, got punctured, then it will be large. So if my bike stops working and let's say punctured, what will happen? I will get the first risk factor is there. Around. Of course, you can move it a little bit here and there, but it will be in that yellow part. It has an impact. I don't want to come late because of my time. Okay? And then the second risk factor, R2. Where? What is the probability of uh, accident? <coughs> it's a little bit higher, perhaps. A little bit higher, but not high. A little bit higher, because it's raining. I could slide, I could fall. I, you, another uh, bikers or another car, they didn't use their uh, winds. Uh, uh, or the screen uh, washers, and then they didn't see me, hit me. You know, it's in the morning, some people, it's Monday, people been partying the last uh, night, right? <laughs> last two days, maybe they hit me with their car. So it's a little bit high. So I will put it there. And it has larger consequences for time because I will probably maybe get injured. Uh, so this is the situation with this R1 and R2. But what about R3? R3 is insignificant, actually. Because, yes, the, do the, the way was blocked, for instance. But there are hundreds of ways it takes you from Lava to, 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 to Valdez. So this is the risk situation after analyzing the uh, consequences and probability regarding time. I must admit, of course, the, the, uh, the positioning of these things can vary. There's no standard rule for that. But the most important that you should justify where, why you put them there. And it shouldn't be based on guessing, but on discussion. <coughs> and then, now you should really help me with this. Now, about safety. I will look into these three uh, factors also regarding safety. Where I will put R1. <coughs> If the tire stopped, is the tire punctured? Does this have any impact on my safety? How? It's not a car, it's just a bike. Uh, what do you think? Probability is low again because it's you know it's a new bike. But, yeah, relative. So I thought, well, I don't think if 
my brakes stopped working, it will have any impact on, uh, on safety because I will stop bike. Wrong. I didn't hit anything, they just stop working. Or if the tire puncture, I will just stop bike. I will not fall. So R1 is very, is very But what about R2? I guess you will say that it's a little bit high. And what about R3? R3 is just behind R1. Now, what is the overall rating now? If we look about both time and safety. We will see that R1 and R2 are significant risk factors. They are not critical based on the project description, but they are significant. Uh, moderate, if you want. And R3 is marginal. Then we can forget about R3. And then somebody now will tell me, yes, but you have overlooked a very important thing. You know what I have overlooked? Anyone can tell me what I have overlooked? Anyone? Anyone who bikes? Who loves biking? What we what we gain when we bike? What we gain? Health. Right? So this is the opportunity. Not every project is only risk, but there are opportunities. What we gain out of that? What we gain of using a specific software? What we gain of using a specific process? What we gain of using him in the project? <laughs> right? So we have to construct a similar matrix, right? For the gaining we get. And then you see better health. Large, small, probability, low and high. And of course, here I was very uh, moderate. I mean, if you are just biking for 25 minutes, the impact on health is not really much. It's not like I'm biking for hours a day. It's just a little bit, you know, clubs, things you shape, you get happy. Uh, that's a, that's a, you get your blood circulation. It has a short tail, not too much impact. And if the probability is high, really, if you bike the road from Lada through Tihok and down to Glos, Haugen, and then to Valgrina, it's good tail. So high probability. So we put it in M1 there. And now we look at the, yes. I thought that financial savings was an opportunity, or is it uh, something else? Which one? Financial savings, like cost savings of cycling instead of not taking bus and driving. Could be, but I didn't include it. Could Would it be here opportunity, or would it be? Yeah, but no, because you know, in this exercise, I was focusing on health, on health issues, right? And on money. Uh, sorry, not on money, on time. But if it's my pocket is influenced by that, then I will have put another one exactly for cost. But now I don't care. I have a lot of money. I don't care about uh, costs. That's a good question. Yeah. See, important to understand your project objectives. What's important for you? So I did it. Now what we do in order to figure out what we should really be doing is to put everything together. And here comes the risk situation. On the right hand side you have the risks, and on the right, left hand side you have the opportunities. As you can see, you have R1 and R, R2 are significant, but M1 is also significant. What shall we do now? What shall I do? Give me advice based on this. What are the options I have? No, the first option is to just just continue doing what I am doing. Only shouldn't I do any other measures? Yeah, I think the right thing to do in my in my opinion would be like take the bus, right? 
this in, eliminate the entire risk of falling and the entire risk of the being delayed. I can take a bus, right? And the bus will bring me safe because the probability that you have an accident in a bus is much, 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 much lower than accident when you are on a bike. That's, that's a fact. So I can eliminate. And when it comes to time, we know in Trondheim, buses, they have their own lanes, so it goes fast. So I could take the bus. But what I am missing here is the opportunity. So in order to fix that, what I should do, yeah, maybe I should reduce the probability that a delay takes place. For, a, for example, yeah, have a time reserve. Rather than leaving my home uh, 9.35, why I can't leave my home 9.25, 10 minutes before that? Then I have the time to, just in case, I'm sure you hear this thing, just in case, just in case, it's just a little bit time. You add to your plan, buffer, your buffer. And by this buffer, you reduce the probability. You don't reduce the consequences, just the probability that it happens. Uh, sorry, the consequences, not the problem. Accidents. What you do that? There, there is, uh, I could be exposed for accidents. Yes. Well, I could reduce the, both the probability and the consequence. I could use, reduce the probability that accident by biking on the sidewalk. Avoid the road. By biking slowly. And then to reduce the, or make myself more visible in the traffic with more reflexes, more lights, all directions, right? Better clothing. And I can reduce the consequences by protecting myself. I should go out with a helmet, I should go with gloves, I should go with four, five, six of leather jackets around me <laughs> so that if I fall, I will get much help. So as you can see, this is how you address risks how you define them, and how you uh, look all the time about the objectives of your task. That, is, that example concludes our lectures for today.